Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And a couple of days ago, we covered the Parler lawsuit against Amazon Web Services. If you aren't familiar with that story, Parler, a small, what they call micro-blogging application or website, really a competitor to Twitter that prides itself on moderating and deplatforming a little less Then the big tech giants was pulled off of the iTunes app store, the Google Play store, and then ultimately from the actual infrastructure of the internet by Amazon Web Services that was providing Parler with cloud computing technology. So that happened, I believe, at the end of last week over the course of this last weekend, and then Parler sued Amazon on Monday. Now, we covered that lawsuit here in virtual legality. We talked about it at length, but the Basics of what Parler was alleging against Amazon was as follows. Thus, AWS, Amazon Web Services, is violating Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. We talked about that. AWS is also breaching its contract with Parler, which requires Amazon Web Services to provide Parler with a 30-day notice before terminating the service, rather than the less than 30-hour notice Amazon Web Services actually provided. And finally, Amazon Web Services is committing intentional interference with prospective economic advantage given the millions of users expected to sign up in the near future. As part of this complaint, they sued for injunctive relief, including a temporary restraining order, which would have Amazon Web Services required to restore Parler to access to that cloud computing technology on an emergency basis. We talked about all three components of this claim by Parler last week. Please do check out that video if you are interested in the specifics there. But now we have Amazon's response to Parler. And as we suggested in the earlier video, Parler had some difficulties. They had some hurdles to overcome in bringing their claims. I really didn't think the Sherman Antitrust Act claim was very strong. I definitely didn't think the tort claim was very strong. And originally, when I first read their complaint, I thought their breach of contract claim might hold water before ultimately coming to the determination, as you saw in that earlier video, that probably Amazon had covered the bases needed in order to suspend the account, ultimately terminate the account, because they could claim that Parler was breaching their agreement with Amazon. They didn't owe 30 days of notice or cure period that Parler says that they did, which I also said as part of that video, maybe wasn't a great thing. If you're going to sign an infrastructure contract with somebody, it's important to get some kind of transition period because of what you are seeing here with respect to Parler. I am, if you're not familiar with virtual legality, not necessarily okay with everything that you see happening on the internet right now with the various applications that are getting pulled down, with big tech setting the terms and conditions, the terms of engagement, if you will, for every interaction they have with everybody online and really now at this point offline and being able to just kill an application entirely like you saw happen with Parler. I am, however, a big fan of freedom of contract. I'm a big fan of the First Amendment freedoms, and we're going to talk about those in just a second. And I'm also a big fan of reading the terms of service and when you agree to what those terms of service say, being bound by them when Parler appears to be trying to get out of that just a little bit. Now, before we dive into the substance of this response, or as it's called here, opposition to motion for temporary restraining order filed by Amazon Web Services, I do want to call your attention to that First Amendment concept just a little bit. In the first video that we did talking about this Parler lawsuit, I did comment on the fact that this wasn't, in fact, a First Amendment issue. That the First Amendment that protects freedom of speech, which Parler very much wants to have on its side, and there's some rhetoric in their complaint about that, only restricts the power of the government to do bad things against you. The folks that can throw you in a cage, otherwise penalize you uh, at severe penalty from the governmental forces, those are the only ones that can't do something under the First Amendment. Doesn't mean that freedom of speech isn't still an important philosophical goal, especially in the United States and United States history, that Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and some of these other tech giants got big by telling people that they believed in freedom of speech. But it does mean that if they go back on that, Outside of a fraud claim, outside of a breach of their own contract, you don't necessarily have an action against them. Going one step further, Amazon Web Services 
is a person, a fictional person in the United States, and they are entitled to their own First Amendment protections, which means that you can't force them to say things that they don't want to say. You can't force them to host something that they don't want to host. They have freedoms under the U.S. Constitution as what we see as a legal fiction, effectively a group of investors that have pooled their resources in order to build something bigger than any one person could. The United States affords them those rights. So Amazon can say, you can't make me do this thing with you. You can't force me to contract with you. You can't force me to host your materials. And so in in point of fact, although I said it's not a First Amendment issue in that first video, it is in part, only it's to the benefit of Amazon Web Services. And you don't have to finish this video agreeing with that legal structure. My job here is to tell you how the law sees things right now, not to tell you how to feel about it. I have my own concerns about what we are seeing with these big tech giants. I've had them for years. You can check out many, many, many videos in virtual legality with me reading terms of service, talking about ambiguities, talking about how Facebook and YouTube and Twitter use those ambiguities in a very problematic fashion for users and really trying to encourage people to read the terms and conditions to the best of their ability. With that all as background, let's dive in to the answer to their complaint because I think for the most part, It's a pretty effective document from Amazon. This case is not about suppressing speech or stifling viewpoints. It is not about a conspiracy to restrain trade. That's a reference to Sherman and antitrust. Instead, this case is about Parler's demonstrated unwillingness and inability to remove from the servers of Amazon Web Services, AWS, content that threatens the public safety, such as by inciting and planning the rape, torture, and assassination of named public officials and private citizens. There is no legal basis in AWS's customer agreements or otherwise to compel AWS to host content of this nature. Now, as I said in this introduction, the first thing they try to kill is any reference to the Sherman Antitrust Act. Hey, there is no restraint of trade here. If you go back and you look at the original lawsuit, you'll see references made by Parler to the fact that Amazon and Amazon Web Services particularly has recently entered into an agreement with Twitter and effectively spending a few pages implying heavily that Amazon has a certain vested interest in seeing Twitter succeed. And so when Parler had the door open for it, that had the opportunity to take a bunch of Twitter's user base, that Amazon shut that door, presumably to benefit themselves. One of the problems we will see is that that original complaint is very high on innuendo and not so high on actual facts on the ground. Now, you can disagree with that. And and as a matter of fact, I'm told a couple of lawyers online, YouTube lawyers and elsewhere, have disagreed with that and think that Parler has a great Sherman Antitrust Act claim. I disagree. But reasonable minds can differ on these things. And as a lawyer, I've looked at this and I can tell you that the Sherman Antitrust Act claim is very difficult to bring and certainly very difficult to win in this context where you have a contract You have what appears to be a legitimate breach that Amazon wrote into the contract, sure, but that Parler appears to be breaching. And you have Amazon using its rights under that contract, which again, they wrote. That's absolutely true. And so we're left with a company that seems to be using the rights that you agreed to give them if you are Parler and now getting sued for it. Others will look at this and say, big tech's too big. They're doing all these things. All that kind of implied coordination with Twitter is legitimate and the law should do something about it. And, you know, maybe justice requires that. Maybe we need to look at the legal structure and those kinds of things. But I can't sit here and tell you that I think it's a good Sherman Antitrust Act claim. And that's just my opinion. I would also caution folks that go elsewhere on YouTube or Twitter or anywhere else online. If you hear somebody guaranteeing something about an antitrust claim, a Sherman claim, anywhere else, really, Don't take their word as sacrosanct. Nobody can guarantee how those kinds of claims will go. They are so fact specific. They are so poorly kind of adjudicated on the edges. And when you combine those concepts with technology, judges don't know what's going on. The antitrust acts were not written for everything that we're talking about right now. They coordinate in really weird ways. You get the right judge on the right day and the stars are aligned in just the right fashion. And yeah, maybe if you're parlor, you win somebody's attention on a claim like that. I think it's highly unlikely, but it's not impossible. And in that same breath, 
somebody else that might think it is likely should do well to admit that it's not a guarantee slam dunk. AWS suspended Parler's account as a last resort to prevent further access to such content, including plans for violence to disrupt the impending presidential transition. So know what they're trying to do here, and they will do this again at the end of this answer. They are trying to establish not just that Amazon has the right to terminate the agreement, or more specifically to suspend it with the right to further terminate if they should so choose, but also to express it as important to the public, that it's a public safety issue, that impliedly in this answer, that Amazon's reputation could be hurt if somebody gets injured or, God forbid, killed if they allowed these messages to be transmitted on this service. So while that isn't, in my opinion, the strongest, most focused legal argument for why we can do what we do under our contract, it may well be an effective rhetorical one. And when we're talking about things like a temporary restraining order request and the answer to that request, sometimes the rhetoric is as important. Because if you didn't follow our Epic versus Apple coverage, it's important to know that a temporary restraining order is effectively asking for a special action of the court, what we call an equitable action, where the court looks at justice, and we'll talk a little bit about how it looks at justice, and says this would be the most just outcome. And how the court interprets that is not really black letter law. It's not black and white on the page. It's not necessarily the contract terms. It's this whole stew of different things that they've balanced one way or the other to determine where the court thinks justice actually lives. Continuing with the answer. Despite Parler's rhetoric, its lawsuit is no more than a meritless claim for breach of contract. But the facts are unequivocal. If there is any breach, it is Parler's demonstrated failure and inability to identify and remove such content. AWS was well within its right to suspend Parler immediately for those failures. Parler also cannot hold AWS liable in tort for enforcing the agreement's express terms. Tort is a concept, if you aren't familiar with it in the law, that is generally built around giving someone redress, compensating them for damages that are outside of agreed upon contracts. That contract law is separate from tort law. And when you have this kind of overlap where you've agreed to certain rights and obligations between two parties, Amazon is correct here to say tort law is a somewhat poor substitute for what we have otherwise agreed to under the contract itself. And so most courts in most circumstances are going to look askance at a tort claim in this particular context, which is what I suggested in that earlier video. And there is no antitrust claim where, as here, Parler cannot plausibly plead an agreement to cause it harm. You have to show some kind of conspiracy and restraint of trade. And the complaint of conduct is undeniably compatible with a legitimate purpose, which you also heard me discuss in that earlier video when we talk about what Amazon has actually done here, if they are using their contract rights, if they have some kind of legitimate business reason to do that, then you have a lot of difficulty bringing these claims. Compelling AWS to host content that plans, encourages, and incites violence would be unprecedented. And that's really kind of the hammer blow to something like this. In order to get a temporary restraining order, and although we use the word restraining here, Parler is actually asking the court to force Amazon to stop suspending its account, effectively requiring Amazon to be forced to have Parler on its web services. When we're talking about a request like that, it's very important to the court to not do things that are super novel. What this is described as by Amazon as unprecedented. There can be circumstances that require something without precedent to take place. But Amazon here is saying, if you force us to put this speech up. That's bad enough. If it were just cake recipes that we didn't like, we're still allowed to terminate it for X, Y, or Z. But here, it's stuff that we feel, and they're going to argue this in good faith, and you can sit here in the comments of my video and say, Amazon is lying. And we don't know that one way or the other. We're not in the room with Amazon. We certainly all have our feelings on big technology companies. You can feel that way, but Amazon says it's not the case, that we're really legitimately concerned about incitement to violence, and you can't force us to put it up court. That would be the height of injustice. And that's the overview of what Amazon wants to say. And that alone, I think, is probably going to be enough to win the day from a temporary restraining order perspective. Not necessarily. 
Just like you might have seen when we were covering Epic versus Apple, courts can try to split the baby here and say, Amazon, legitimately, how much will you be hurt if you just give Parler 30 days? No one's asking for you to host them forever. Your agreement clearly says you can terminate for convenience any 30-day period. Maybe you should put them up 30 days more. The reason I think that might well not work in this instance is because Amazon covers that ground quite well towards the end of this answer, and that's going to be something that we talk about as part of this video. Then they give some facts. Parler prides itself on its hands-off approach to moderating user content. They give some quotes. If you can say it on the street of New York, you can say it on Parler. We really don't want to get into the business of kind of determining what is and is not allowed to be discussed. And here's where I think you get into the politics and the rhetoric of this issue. It is certainly the case that a fair number of people, and on some days, myself included, are kind of done with the enforcement, the arbitrariness, the capriciousness of the way big tech enforces its various rules. Maybe that's political. Maybe you think very strongly that it is political. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just dumb people in a room somewhere deciding to moderate on whatever willy-nilly reason that they have behind them. Either way, it feels unfair. It feels like you're investing in a platform that you clearly don't control, that is arbitrary to the extreme in how it decides to dole out death and justice. And people don't want to be a part of that anymore. A certain contingent of those people would have been attracted to a business model like Parler's that says, look, we don't want to moderate. We don't want to get into the business of deciding your politics. But Amazon doesn't like that. Clearly, that's implied throughout the rest of this document. They want something to be moderated. And Parler, to its credit, says we do moderate a little bit, primarily designed around these kinds of things, violence and harassment, but Amazon isn't satisfied with the job they are doing. And that creates this kind of butting of heads from a philosophy standpoint, where it says Amazon, which now controls this substantial portion of the infrastructure of the internet, says you have to moderate in a way that satisfies us to get the use of our services. Now, the corporate lawyer in me says, yeah, that makes sense. They have these servers. They invested in these servers. They built this infrastructure. They get to say who gets led into the gate and who doesn't. The opposite side of that spectrum is, of course, well, once they control a significant amount of the cloud computing availability on the internet, should it not be treated more as what you might have seen referenced by Epic as an essential facility in the case of the Apple App Store, which I said was not a great argument in that context. And to be truth, essential facilities aren't a great argument to bring up to the United States Supreme Court, period, because the court has all but disavowed that entire philosophy? Or should you be seeking government intervention to have things that are related to the internet be treated solely as utilities, public infrastructure that needs to be made available on a completely neutral basis? That's some of the fighting that you see regularly with things like the FCC and even the FTC. And should regulators get involved? One of the reasons that I think everything that you saw last week with respect to Donald Trump and all of the various applications that moved and what Twitter did and now what Amazon did and how Parler was treated and all this other stuff. One of the reasons I think that is potentially problematic for the internet at large is because government is standing by ready to regulate these things in a fashion that I think you and I and YouTube and everyone else probably won't like terribly much. Now, I included YouTube in that list, but that might not be the case because the big companies that already exist can probably set the rules in a fashion that allows them to survive while upstarts maybe do not. Either way, I don't think the technology companies are really thinking that all the way through. And so I look at this and say, yes, there's some bad stuff that's being said. Yes, people need to behave better. Yes, you should have a say if you own the, the, these servers and this infrastructure in how that server infrastructure is treated. But wow, this is a lot of power in a very concentrated number of entities and really number of people, individuals. And that I think should give everybody pause. If you believe in general in the philosophy of freedom and freedom of sp speech and liberty and moving that forward, which if you've been in virtual legality before, you know that I do. But I digress. Let's continue with the answer from Amazon. On June 12th, 2018, Parler signed up with AWS, which provides hosting and cloud computing services for businesses, nonprofits, and government organizations globally. Parler accepted the terms of the AWS customer agreement, which is exactly what we looked at in our prior video, right? The AWS customer agreement. 
The agreement requires that Parler ensure that your content and your and end users' use of your content or the service offerings will not violate any of the policies or any applicable law. The agreement also requires Parler to immediately suspend access to content that it learns violates its obligations under the agreement. And you see them reference this as, I believe it's 4.2 and 4.5, and we can scroll down. This wasn't actually the section that I had referenced in my prior video. They talk about it under the Your Responsibilities section as a breach. That would undoubtedly be true. I actually qualified it under the Representations and Warranties as a breach, where they represent that all the content will not violate the acceptable use policy. And so I think you can get them in a couple of different ways because by the time you get to the acceptable use policy, you've got very broad language designed to protect Amazon. Obviously that makes sense. They wrote it, uh, but you can come at this question from a couple of different sections. Indeed, Amazon's answer goes back to that acceptable use policy in the very next paragraph. Parler further agreed to comply with AWS's acceptable use policy. The AUP in turn makes clear that Parler's agreement not to use AWS to host certain content, including content that violates the rights of others, or that may be harmful to others. In fact, it goes a little bit further than that and says, or maybe harmful to others or our reputation. Now, one of the interesting things here is that you see that Amazon doesn't throw every possible argument they have up against the wall. This is a little bit of legal strategy, right? They certainly could have said it harms our reputation. And so we get the right to say that's a violation of the AUP. It falls back under the customer use agreement. So that's a breach. We can suspend, we can terminate, but it's not the strongest argument they have when they can focus like a laser beam on this notion that if you put this back up on our service judge, people are going to get hurt or killed. And I don't ask you to necessarily believe that argument. I'm asking you to Think about it strategically as to whether or not that is the strongest legal argument. I think Amazon was pretty wise here to not focus on things like reputation or the very edges of the rights that they have granted to themselves in the acceptable use policy and the customer use agreement that they wrote, but instead to focus on this very specific, very special circumstance coming out of the capital riots and moving forward to the inauguration day. The agreement further makes clear that AWS may suspend or terminate an account immediately. Upon notice, if AWS determines that an end user's use of the services poses a security risk to the service offerings or any third party or otherwise breaches the agreement. And this was one of those areas where I thought they really had a silver bullet because once you get out of this 30-day window, which is what Parler was focused on right here, an uncured breach for 30 days. And once you get down into, if we have the right to suspend you, we can terminate then you're in trouble if you're Parler because effectively Amazon has reserved two separate rights to terminate, one of which can be done immediately, one of which requires the 30 days of notice and uncured status. And they've gone with this second window and you agreed to it. And that might not be fair, right? Maybe you didn't read the agreement. Obviously, if you're running an app and you're going to use this as the foundational skeleton of your app infrastructure, you probably should have read it, probably should have had console review it and warn you of these things beforehand. But assuming that you didn't do that, you now know that Amazon has effectively two ways to go around the horn here and terminate slash suspend your agreement, which gives you some trouble. In mid-November 2020, AWS received reports that Parler was hosting content threatening violence in breach of the agreement. On November 17th, 2020, seeking to better understand Parler's approach to content moderation, AWS provided Parler two representative examples, asked whether this type of content violates Parler's policies, and asked for more detailed information on Parler's policies and processes for handling and mitigating such content. Two days later, Parler responded that it had referred one of the examples to its regular contact for investigation. Over the next seven weeks, just about two months, AWS reported more than 100 additional representative pieces of content advocating violence to Parler's chief policy officer, including, now I'm not going to read the entirety of this list. I don't want to flag every YouTube robot to come at me and tell me that I'm otherwise violating YouTube policy somehow by reporting the news of this legal document. But I am going to note that there's some bad stuff in here. I will also note that I don't know the volume of messages that is put up on Parler, but in fact, 100 pieces over seven weeks 98 pieces that they show in the letter to Parler, those numbers don't shock the conscience from where I'm sitting. You see a lot bigger numbers in a lot of these reports on very, very bad things that you see on Facebook or YouTube or elsewhere. And so I think one of the problems that you're going to have in a case like this is judges 
trying to figure out how significant of a situation this is. Now, it might not get to that. In fact, I think it won't get to that because Amazon has what I view as a very clear right to suspend and terminate the agreement under the language that they had agreed to with Parler. But when you start to get into these things and say, we've got a hundred bad things that were said, I, I don't know that that actually is that significant for what should be a reasonable amount of volume uh, of messages on the service. One thing I did want to note, which I think is one of their more useful things that they found was a was a note that said, we are going to go fight in a civil war for militias and acquire targets. That's the kind of thing that you can point to if you're on Amazon Council's side and say, that's exactly what we are concerned about. The rest of this strikes me as primarily hyperbole, scary hyperbole. Don't recommend communicating like you see in this complaint or answer to a complaint at all. But with respect to hyperbolic messaging, that isn't actually the harassment or immediate threat of violence that can result in very bad things happening to, to Parler or, or even to Amazon. So you get into a attenuated argument that says, Amazon, I don't want any of that stuff on my service, but it's not something that I am likely to be legally liable for. Continuing with their answer, on January 6th, 2021, rioters supporting President Trump's efforts to overturn President-elect Biden's victory stormed the U.S. Capitol, which comes off as a bit of a non sequitur here, right? Amazon says, well, we, sh we found all of this violent rhetoric on the service, and then they talk about the riot. Content encouraging violence continued to grow rapidly after the events of January 6th, and on January 8th, 9th, and 10th, AWS reported additional examples of that content. So they're trying to tie it all together. Again, a little bit of rhetorical device here. Hey, remember that riot? That was really bad. And this was a part of that. And things got worse on this service immediately thereafter. That's why we acted when we did judge. In response, Parler outlined additional reactive steps that would rely almost exclusively on quote unquote volunteers. During one of the calls, Parler CEO reported that Parler had a backlog of 26,000 reports of content that violated its community standards and remained on its service. Now, a couple of things here. That's a significant number, uh, and that's a significant thing for Amazon to bring up. I also have to ask the question, if you are Parler, and if you are Parler's CEO, why did you say this to Amazon as part of a telephone call? talking about presumably how well you are doing and making sure that Amazon should be satisfied with your services. I don't know in what context this comes up. It's clearly a mistake on the part of Parler CEO. It's always good to get the truth out there if this is in fact the case, uh, but you do have to wonder about the strategy from Parler in terms of divulging this information to what at this point in time must have seemed like a hostile party, but here we are. On January 9th, 2021, Apple and Google terminated Parler's accounts. The same day, AWS notified Parler it would suspend its account effective 11.59 p.m. January 10th. Now, this is one of those areas that you can kind of argue about legal strategy. So they reference the fact that Apple and Google terminated Parler's accounts, presumably as a backstop. Hey, judge, we aren't acting crazily. Other companies came to the same conclusion that we did. And so we're just acting and going along with the flow. We don't have this negative pretext. You can't tie it to Twitter because everybody acted. But in the case of the rhetoric and the politics and the antitrust claim here, it does kind of ring of we all acted together in a fashion that doesn't look great from the outside. As a lawyer, however, I would say none of that really matters to the legal claims in front of the court. So it probably wasn't the wrong idea for Amazon to do that right here. It just kind of jumps out at you if you are at all kind of concerned about big trust, uh, big tech antitrust actions at all, which if the House of Representatives subcommittee is any indication is a lot of the United States. Now, it's also worth noting here, I've highlighted this footnote that one of the things we talked about in that earlier video was the fact that Parler claimed that the letter that was sent to them by Amazon was leaked directly by Amazon to BuzzFeed because of the timing in the emails. Amazon reposts here and says, but that timing complaint is based on an erroneous assumption that the timestamp on the email showing Parler received the letter reflects Pacific time rather than central time. In fact, Amazon sent the letter to Parler before the press obtained the letter. I actually thought the sentence might end with before we sent it to the press. Nope, it doesn't say that. Before the press obtained the letter, passive voice, we don't know how they got it. Who, who knows how they got it? Maybe Parler sent it to them. Who knows? Either way, it's kind of an interesting one. 
There isn't a lot of reason why the email servers for Parler would be set to Central Time. As far as I know, everything I looked up around them uh, suggests that they are headquartered in Nevada, but maybe who received this had a Central Time Zone outlook or, or whatever it was set to. It seems unlikely that Amazon is lying about this particular point because they will have an email on their side of things that shows exactly when they sent it. And they can frame it with the knowledge that Parler thinks it was 719 Pacific time. Oh, it shows that we sent it at X time here when we sent it. So that actually means that their server must be set to central time. I can't imagine that they lied about this, but note that it does undercut one of Parler's inequities uh, that they were trying to bring against Amazon. I mentioned it in the earlier video, but Amazon doing that, if it was obvious that they leaked out the letter, is the kind of thing that a court says, oh, naughty, naughty. We might think about doing a temporary restraining order or some kind of other equitable relief because we don't want people to be acting as bad actors. If Amazon did not, in fact, act as a bad actor on that and they can prove it, well, that takes out another argument that Parler might have against them. That evening, Parler CEO posted that we should be operational within less than 12 hours of downtime after Amazon abruptly pulls our access. We will see this quote come back again later on in this answer, but this is another area where the Parler CEO appears to have shot himself in the foot because Amazon is going to try to establish that they claim irreparable harm, they claim they need a temporary restraining order, but not 10 minutes after we sent this email, they said, everything's going to be fine. We're going to get right back up on the internet. Now, there's a completely legitimate answer to that if you're on the parlor side of things that says, that's what we thought, but as it turns out, Amazon had so poisoned the well of public interest in our application that now no one will take us and we can't get back up on the internet. We can't do it as easily as we thought we could have. Judge and Amazon now is just confusing the issue when we thought we would have everything under control. Then we get to Amazon's actual argument here, and this is about the temporary restraining order. If you did follow that earlier series on Epic versus Apple, you know that we've talked about what a temporary restraining order needs in order to be granted by a court. You need to show them that you're probably going to win this thing because they're going to be giving you your redress early. You need to show them that if they don't give you that redress, you're going to suffer an irreparable harm. Finally, you need to show them, and I'm going to combine these because Amazon does in this answer, that the balance of equities, that between Amazon and me, justice lies on my side, and the public interest, the folks that aren't involved in this lawsuit, both would benefit by the granting of the temporary restraining order. And now Amazon is going to go through one by one, and really with a focus on the likelihood of the win condition, establish for the court why a temporary restraining order should not be granted in their eyes. First, Parler cannot show a likelihood of prevailing on the merits. Parler claims AWS breached the agreement by failing to provide 30 days notice of termination, but it was Parler who breached the agreement. Now, a couple of things are interesting here. I, as you know from the earlier video and from earlier in this video, believe that Amazon has a relatively clean case of establishing that there's a breach here, that they've reserved the right to terminate, that they've reserved the right to suspend for any breach of the agreement. And as such, they probably have a pretty clean way of saying that Parler is wrong. That being said, I think this is probably the wrong sentence to come right after responding to this particular claim from Parler. Parler claims Amazon breached, but it was Parler who breached, is in my opinion, and reasonable minds can differ on these things, kind of a bad look for a document of this type. They say we breached, but they breached, Judge. It comes across as very much those two siblings fighting in the yard and with mom trying to figure out who did what and why. Now, they actually get at the end of this paragraph to the point, if Parler fails to comply with its duties, if they did breach, then we're allowed to do all of this stuff, which means we didn't breach, which is really what you want to say. Parler claims we breached, but we did not judge. We had the right to do what we did. And instead they say, but it was Parler who breached. And I, I just don't think that it's a terribly effective pose from a rhetorical standpoint. They further go on to say, people have acted on the calls to create problems here. They're trying to establish once again for the court that not only is it a breach kind of technically, it's a breach in philosophy that Amazon doesn't want to be in the business of putting these messages out there in the world. In fact, they don't use great evidence here, but these are very quick motions. You don't need really heightened evidence. There hasn't been any discovery or anything like that. And they wind up going to a recode article about the fact that Parler was used to organize things. 
Newer tools like the lightly moderated social media site Parler and the anonymous messaging service Telegram were used to organize the Capitol Hill riot. Now, interestingly enough, if you're interested in the big tech side of this, the very next sentence is, some of those people have also used mainstream platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, winding up in the same place that Parler wants you to be thinking, which is, hey, you're acting against us, you didn't act against other people, but Amazon has an answer to that as well. Parler's complaint is replete with insinuations that AWS had equal grounds to suspend Twitter's account and thus discriminated against Parler. But AWS does not host Twitter's feed. So of course it could not have suspended access to Twitter's content. That's an important point. If they don't really have the ability to do anything negative to Twitter, but it doesn't really fully respond to what Parler went out there with at the top of their complaint, which is, hey, you just entered into this contract. You're going to be doing the same thing for Twitter that you did for us. Effectively, Amazon is saying here, no, we aren't going to be doing that or we haven't done that in the past. And so it isn't something that you can put on us. I find this a fairly weak defense uh, from Amazon on this score. I would have had more that says, hey, that's not what we do. We don't have any control of it. But again, Parler's complaint is already so kind of mired in implication, it's difficult for the Amazon council here to fully combat it because it's all just in the shadows. So it doesn't bother me that much, even though I probably would have come a little stronger on that point in particular. They continue by saying, hey, we don't tortuously interfere with anything. Parler cannot plead around its contract claim by asserting a claim of tortious interference. Where the defendant's alleged interference is the exercise of a contractual right, a plaintiff has no reasonable expectancy and cannot assert an interference claim. We talked about this, right? When there is a contract between the two parties, an actual tortious interference claim is much harder to bring because the court looks at this in a perfectly clean vacuum without bringing in the other facts and circumstances, which can change things, and says, okay, you, you have a contract. You were free to sign it or not sign it. This is what the contract says. It says, when you breach the acceptable use policy, they can suspend you. When they suspend you, they can terminate you. And, and now you're saying that that thing you agreed that they could do is a tortious interference with your prospective economic advantage? It's difficult for me to give you parlor. And I think ultimately the court would come out on this claim, that intentional interference with basically that analysis. Further, as you heard us talk about in that earlier video, parlor has not alleged any interference that was for an improper purpose or through improper means. Improper purpose in Washington requires that the interferer acted out of greed, retaliation, or hostility. And wrongful means requires the alleged interference by wrongful or some other measure beyond the fact of the interference itself. Parler speculates that AWS suspended Parler's account for improper reasons, but that speculation elides entirely the fact that, as AWS repeatedly warned it, Parler repeatedly violated the agreement, which kind of dovetails with what we'll see really towards the end of this answer, which is, hey, if we can say they breached the agreement, if they legitimately breached the agreement, a lot of the rest of this stuff that they complain about in their complaint doesn't matter. And so they can say it's improper means, but this was a fully and freely agreed to contract. These were our rights. We exercised our rights. Judge, are you really going to give them some extra benefit from what we already had the right to do under our contract? And maybe you're sitting there listening to this or watching this on YouTube and think there should be something, Rick. And maybe there should, but there isn't right now in the legal structure that we have. Finally, they say with respect to the likelihood of a win on the merits, AWS did not violate Sherman. Plaintiff's complaint fails to plead the most basic elements of a Section 1 claim, namely that there wasn't an agreement made. Parler does not even claim that Twitter and AWS communicated about Parler, much less formed an agreement, nor could it. As a senior AWS executive testified, AWS did not authorize and is not aware of such communications. A conclusory allegation of agreement at some identified point does not supply facts adequate to show illegality. Further, following those precedents, courts dismiss Section 1 complaints when there is an independent business justification for the observed conduct. Here, not only does AWS have a legitimate business reason to suspend Parler's account, but that reason, keeping content that violates its agreement with customers off of its servers, is the only plausible conclusion. To be clear, AWS has no incentive to stop doing business with paying customers that comply with its agreements. Now, you heard me talk about that in the earlier video, and I generally agree that for the most part, somebody selling access to server infrastructure wants to, stay with me, sell that access to the server infrastructure. But here they go maybe one bridge too far. 
the only plausible conclusion, no incentive to stop doing business, that isn't really accurate. And any judge is going to know that. Parler puts maybe a slightly political rhetorical flourish filled complaint together, but suggests that they have a big reason that yes, they will make less money from Parler, but they might've lost money from Twitter. And that more importantly, they have a long-term agreement with Twitter that Parler was just about to eat into. So does Parler actually allege an agreement and restrain a trade? Not maybe on its face, but they do allege that there's an agreement between Amazon Web Services and Twitter that exists and that Amazon is going to benefit by taking this action on a pretextual basis, that they don't really care about all the rest of this stuff that they say they care about. What they care about is that Parler was about to eat Twitter's lunch and they could stop it from happening. And maybe that's too far. It's all implication. It's all inference in the Parler complaint. And as I said, I think it's ultimately a loser in court, and I don't think they're going to get their temporary restraining order. But... Amazon going this far and saying there's no other conclusion that you could draw, there's no incentive to stop doing business with paying customers, doesn't do the math. If Twitter is worth a lot more and Parler was going to take that money away from that Twitter-Amazon relationship, there can be incentives. There can be other conclusions to be drawn. And so I think maybe this is another area where Amazon doesn't quite defeat the complaint except for the fact that Parler didn't really draft a great one in the first place. The final paragraph in this section says as much. Parler's antitrust allegations fail also because they do not even plead the basic requirements of a Sherman Act claim, such as how competition is harmed, the relevant product and geographic markets, the share of those markets enjoyed by AWS. Parler freely admits that it has access to numerous potential web hosting service providers not claimed to be involved in or restrained by the alleged conspiracy with whom Parler can freely contract those alternatives alone preclude Parler from stating a plausible claim for relief. And maybe they do. Certainly Parler's complaint was very quickly done. And one of the things that it can use to its credit is to say, look, you can tell we really need a temporary restraining order, that this is clearly an emergency to us because we slammed this out over the weekend. It's 20 pages long. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles of these fancy Seattle lawyers, uh, your honor. But Also, those fancy Seattle lawyers are are pretty much right. It really lacks all the contours here. And while I think they combine a little bit of the restraint of trade precedent with the actual monopolization precedent, which you don't actually have to establish to to win a Sherman Antitrust Act claim in terms of Section 1, they are still right to say it didn't look anything like I'm used to seeing when you talk about antitrust actions. And so, again... I really don't think Sherman is a winner, even though I'm told other YouTube lawyers think that it might be. Finally, as you saw in that prior video, they bring up the Section 230 shield, as you knew they would. In addition to their facial deficiencies, Parler's interference and antitrust claims also fail under Section 230C2 of the Communications Decency Act, which I haven't brought up for your viewing pleasure, but that's the one that says we can moderate stuff and you can't do anything about it. Under that statute, the provider of an interactive computer service is immune for acting in good faith to restrict access to material that is excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. And that highlighted in blue is one of the areas where I think reform is likely to come on Section 230 uh, in probably the near future at this point in time, that that otherwise objectionable is seen by a lot of members of government, Democrat and Republican alike, as giving big technology companies maybe a little bit too much leeway while still enjoying all the fruits of full immunity from their decision making. That is precisely what AWS did here, removed access to content it considered excessively violent and harassing and what some folks would suggest they just found objectionable. Continuing from there, so we've covered the fact that Amazon thinks there is no likelihood of a win, and now we will go very rapidly through the remaining things that are related to asking for a temporary restraining order. The balance of equities and public interest disfavor an injunction. The less certain the likelihood of success on the merits, the more plaintiffs must convince the district court that the public interest and balance of hardships tip in their favor. Again, this is a balancing test. If you win three of them and lose the fourth, if it's still balanced in your favor, you can get that temporary restraining order. If you don't, you don't get it. The hardships on AWS and the public from an injunction would far outweigh any speculative damage Parler claims it may suffer from a short interruption of its service. Here's another area where I think Amazon is doing what it should do, or its counsel is doing what it should do by saying these things, but probably doesn't give full credit to what Parler actually put out there, which is this was the worst possible time for this to happen. That Twitter bans Donald Trump 
Donald Trump is very likely to go over to Parler, bring his crew with him. Parler was going to have the explosion in growth that we thought it was going to have. And by taking these actions at that exact moment, you prevented people from leaving Twitter. Maybe they left to go into one of Parler's competitors, but all too often those folks will stay just from virtue of inertia and that this was done deliberately, that there is undoubtedly hardship that Parler has experienced here if Amazon did something wrong. Amazon's entire last five pages is saying we didn't do anything wrong. They're not going to win on the court case itself. But now we're talking about something differently where we basically assume that there's a wrong here, that somehow Parler could win that case. And now in that world, you look at it and say, oh, Amazon, Parler really was hurt by this. First, compelling AWS to host Parler content would threaten the safety of individuals. This risk is not speculative. Such a requirement also poses a risk to Amazon itself with posts calling for others to burn down Amazon delivery trucks until they reverse course. By suspending Parler's account, AWS seeks to prevent illegal and violent acts from being coordinated using AWS's resources, a right the agreement secures. So they're combining a few things here, right? We're going to win on the merits, which doesn't actually play into this different factor. But also, hey, in terms of public interest, we really, truly, in good faith, believe at Amazon allowing Parler on our web servers will get people hurt or killed. And judge, if we really believe that, you have no business in making us put that language on our service. And that's a fairly compelling point when we're talking about equitable actions of the court. You have to, of course, believe that Amazon believes that. Parler has tried to suggest in their complaint that Amazon is entirely pretextual here. Fancy legal word for lying. And so they're really trying to benefit Twitter and they don't actually care about any of this. But in the face of January 6th, Amazon is probably going to win the rhetorical fight on this point. Second, any injunction would impair AWS's ability to take swift action against customers who misuse its services to promote violence, or really any other reason. And we saw this in Epic versus Apple, right? This is the argument that says, look, we negotiated those terms in our agreement so that we could take action that we needed to take to defend people, sure, also to defend our company and our bottom line and our reputation, but that's in between the lines, Judge. We don't need to say that out loud. You know that. And so if you give this restraining order, if you force us to put this language up, yes, people could be hurt, people could be killed. Also, we won't be able to deal with the next problem because we will have this precedent against us and we will now have to think twice about enforcing our own agreement terms. Finally, Parler's allegations of harm contradict its own public statements. Parler's CEO has assured users that Parler prepared for events like the termination. Now, it's interesting that they reference it as the termination here, right? One of the things you see earlier in the document is they're very clear. They said, we didn't terminate. We just suspended. And there's been people on Twitter and elsewhere that I've interacted with that suggest that's important. I don't think it's important because the Amazon right of suspension leads directly into termination. There's no difference. You don't get 30 more days if they just suspended in the first instance. But it also seems like a mistake of the lawyer here to bracket, to change language here, to make it the termination instead of the suspension. Uh, in respect of what Amazon has actually done against Parler. Parler's CEO has assured users that Parler prepared for events like the termination by never relying on Amazon's proprietary infrastructure, that the site will be fully operational with less than 12 hours of downtime after termination, and that Parler has many companies competing for its hosting business. Accordingly, the balance of the equities and public interest weighs strongly against the issuance of any injunction. Again, as I said, Parler can tell the court, yeah, that's what we thought. We were wrong. And that's why we brought the lawsuit that we did is once we went out to the marketplace and found that, again, the claim would be Amazon poisoned the well against us. Amazon hurt us in that fashion. You might wind up asking, well, why didn't you bring a defamation claim against Amazon at the same time? You get into a whole black hole there. But ultimately, it's not a great idea if you're the CEO to go out. And if you're going to bring a claim that we're going to be doomed because of this action, tell everybody immediately thereafter that we're going to be fine. Finally, Amazon finishes off by saying that Parler will not be irreparably harmed. A TRO is also not warranted because Parler has not shown irreparable harm is likely. Parler has not identified irreparable harm. AWS has promised to preserve Parler's data and help Parler migrate its services elsewhere. I think this might be the weakest argument in Amazon's quiver here. It is clear to me that if you go and you read the Parler complaint, they spent most of the bulk of that complaint really establishing irreparable harm, showing that They were right on the cusp that people were moving over towards Parler, that they had gone up from 1,000th downloaded app to number one when all of this happened, that everybody was saying, we're going to come to Parler after Twitter banned 
President Trump, I think it is very clear that regardless of whether the data was protected from the past, this current window of time will be lost to parlor. And if they were to have a likelihood of winning on the merits, if the balance of the equities favored them, if the public interest favored them, I think it's clear that they have shown irreparable harm with what they drafted in the complaint. I think Amazon is just wrong here. And you can kind of tell in the length that they put to it in this answer, right? Even Amazon says, yeah, that's probably not a winner for us. But again, when we look at this, we don't have to win them all if we're Amazon. We only have to win most of them. Likelihood of the success on the merits is the big one. And so if we do that, if we win most of them, if the balance really favors us on a balancing of these four factors, then we can prevent that TRO. And I think ultimately that's what Amazon decided to do. But you see here, this is the answer from Amazon to the parlor complaint. Unlike Epic versus Apple, this is happening much more quickly, much more emergency based. This is what I'm used to seeing in this kind of space, just to kind of juxtapose it with Epic's 80 page documents and Apple's 71 page documents. This is a little bit more normal when you really are facing an emergency, when you're asking for that special treatment from the court. So overall, I think Parler's complaint is still probably not sufficient legally, although others disagree. I think Amazon's answer is probably good enough to prevent that temporary restraining order from coming into play, especially because a court just isn't going to want to force people to put language and notices up on somebody else's infrastructure that that owner of the infrastructure doesn't want to have, especially if very bad things could erupt from it. So I really do think Amazon's probably going to kill this. I don't know what happens to Parler from then. That doesn't mean I like all of what we have seen happen in the past week with respect to the big tech companies, but I can only call them like I see them here in virtual legality. And that's been our episode of virtual legality for today. If you like this, if you like talking about business and law of not just pop culture, although we usually focus on video games, music, movies, and television, but also technology, software, and the world of the internet in which we live, please do like, subscribe, ring bells, tell people that we're here having these discussions. Would love to see you in the comments. I'd love to talk to folks, especially new folks who haven't been in virtual legality before. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.